Dzień dobry Państwu, chciałem serdecznie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you very cordially on behalf of organizers at the yet another meeting of the Social Forum for the Thought of Exchange in Warsaw. This is yet another event of ours. This time we are organizing this together with the great support uh, of our partners from the Network for Alternative Thinking and Political Dialogue Transfer Europe and this is for our European project. I would like to welcome very cordially our guests, Miki Brady, a, a member of parliament of Irish Sinn Féin. Welcome to Poland. It is an honor for us to be able to see you. Comrade Mario Ferres, who is Secretary for Political Affairs of the Spanish United Left. It is always a pleasure to uh, see you here and that you, you were able to find time to come to us. And this is a very unique situation because it is difficult for me to welcome a host. I would like to welcome Tomek Truskawa very cordially from the Society of Free Speech. He's a well-known socialist activist for the possibility of having this meeting with us and for sharing his reflections with us about the meeting today. Thank you, Tomek. This meeting is supposed to be done uh, on the basis of three thematic blocks. So in the first one, I would like us to answer the questions which changes happened in the self-determination law in Europe. In the second block, I would like us to consider how strong uh, the domination of uh, larger European states is over smaller countries. And in the third block, the last one, I would like us to answer a question whether the European European Union is going towards integration or disintegration. So I propose the following agenda. In the first round, I would like first Miki to speak, uh, uh, to be followed by Marga, and uh, then Ma uh, Tomasz uh, can finish. In the second round, I would like Marga to begin, to be followed by Tomasz. And, uh, Finally, Miki. And the third round, Tomasz would start, then Miki would follow, and Marga. I propose each of the panelists to have eight minutes for a statement. We will have a discussion after each statement, or after each round of statements with the participants of the meeting. And uh, finally, we would like, invite our guests again for a summary and sharing his, their reflections about this meeting. Is it okay for you? I think it is okay. Please sign a list of attendants and take a simultaneous interpretation sets because the discussion will be in both languages, Polish and English. The question of self-determination for nations has been for a long time a subject of discussions in which different uh, groups of Polish and international left are involved. Some uh, believe that it has a greater role, others believe that it has a lesser role in the fight for a better uh, world and socialist vision of the future. I think, however, uh, that a discussion about how important it is in our aspirations to get to our goal, which is socialism, uh, should be a side discussion because we should look at this subject which is discussed today from the European perspective, because this is a part of our European project. Europe that has been integrating for the last 50 years is the best example to testify to uh, what exists in the contemporary and temporary policy, which is different oppositions and conflicts. The deepening of the European integration and cooperation between the states in the European Union is associated by separatist tendencies. Unfortunately, they are not only and always of a left nature, as it is the case in Ireland, Catalonia, or Basque country. The right, extreme right, that is being reborn in Europe is using all the possibilities for it to widespread intolerance and hostility to being different, and it also tries to create panic. It promotes indifference to refugees. A significant number of the countries 
in Europe is inhabited by people who are not members of one nation only. The functioning of these states can be based either on peaceful and voluntary functioning, coexistence, or on the basis of the imposition of the will of one people over other people. It is quite surprising to note that we live in Europe, which is a cradle of European standards of human rights and progressive social and political ideas. By means of uh, legal solutions of some countries, we still uh, deprive our members, European member states, of the right for self-determination. So we have to answer a question what influence it may have on the future of this construct, which is the European Union. The European Union, as a union of 28 countries, is not a very uniform and homogeneous creation. We have different concepts of the European of homelands and federal Europe, and they do not take into account separate tendencies uh, in different European countries that have recently been strengthened, and especially the situation to this extent is observed in uh, the UK and in Spain. Separate tendencies are also, also noted in Italy, in Germany, Germany, in Belgium and Costa Rica, as well as Sweden. The situation in Cyprus is definitely more complicated. The Kurdish question is also very complicated. That is why I would like to ask our guests, can you please evaluate the evolution uh, towards self-determination right on the examples of your country? Miki, the floor is over to you. Um, sorry. Thank you for that. Um, and just in terms of the issue of self-determination in Europe, of nations in Europe and how that has changed, I suppose the European Union's response to the Catalonian referendum is indicative of the answer to that question. Specifically, their silence to state violence and rights abuses carried out by the Spanish state portrays an unwillingness to respect progressive movements of national sovereignty. The national independence movements of stateless nations are typically, but not exclusively, progressive alliances of political parties and civic society seeking political and economic independence, and therefore are entirely antithetical to the, uh, the de definition of self-determination put forth by the right and extreme right. Racist and anti-immigrant vitriol is on the lips of, influence, of influential party leaders in many European countries, and frighteningly in the cases of Poland, Hungary and Slovakia in government. They invoke democracy and national self-determination as rhetorical justification for fascist authoritarian policies which attack, sorry, which attack minorities, demonize refugees and uh, desperate asylum seekers, and they dismiss fundamental rights and restrict the freedom of the press and the judiciary. This exists in stark contrast to the progressive, secular and inclusive nature of the Catalan independence movement. This self-determination is based on a self-evident belief of the Catalan nation that with the state of their own they could do better, they would have the national political and economic independence to construct a republic founded on universal rights, inclusion and equality. This is not an anti-Spanish position, it is simply an unwavering belief in the hopeful prospect of Catalan nationhood and all the good it could do for its citizens free from Spanish state that failed to realise these prospects and reeks of the lingering stench of Francoism. Moving on to our own position in Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin's vision for Ireland is an all-island democratic and socialist republic. The people of Ireland have long been denied a unified state, underpinned by inalienable rights, democracy and economic equality. British rule in Ireland has frustrated the popular national desire for a nation in which to cherish citizens regardless of race, sexuality, age, faith and political belief. Like in Catalonia, those who desire such a state have a duty to build it. Self-determination has indeed changed around Europe. Those who represent progressive and inclusive visions of nationhood are yet to receive recognition from the institutions of the European Union. The calculated crusade of the European elite towards greater fiscal centralisation, pan-European neoliberalism and the creation of a well-armed and refugee-free fortress Europe in recent years 
stands in stark contrast to the outward looking, progressive, inclusive national liberation or independence movements in Ireland, the Basque Country and Catalonia, to name but a few. The institutions of the European Union have promote, promoted a growing anti-immigrant European nationalism and in doing so have empowered regressive national xenophobic and quasi-fascist movements. Sorry, sorry. I, I have that problem. Um, prevalent and resurgent in former imperial powers. Europe's failure to adequately address the humanitarian and economic crises brought about by their own policies is being spun as a threat to the cohesion of the European Union. They see the ground on allowing blame to fall in individual member states, mobile labour, ethnic minorities and foreigners. The growing centralisation of power in the EU will continue to foment national disquiet. A majority of this disquiet has, to this point, manifested itself in the rise of the xenophobia and anti-EU right wing. It is up to the progressive, Eurocritical, nationally focused parties and movements in Europe to provide <coughs> viable and popular alternatives to the lazy dogma of the growing right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to come to Poland. Uh, it's my first time here. I'm really very happy to be here. I read a lot about Poland, and it's, it's really an honor for me to be here in Warsaw and to listen and to hear you about what the situation in Poland. I think this kind of meeting is really necessary for us to learn each other. And then I come back to Spain and to talk about the situation here. That will be really very good. No? The question that uh, Czeslaw asks us is how the right to self-determination change in Europe now. And I think we have different answers to different situations. So my answer will be depends. Depends how rich the country uh, who wants to vote is. Meaning that we have in the last year three examples or, uh, about this question. The first one is the Greece situation. In Greece, we have a government, a progressive government, who wants to make some progressive things for the Greece people. And the European Union stop any progressive policy in the country, stop any sovereignty of the Greece people to implement any policy in the country. So what the self-determination is that? In meaning that if you have a country, okay, you have a government, but you don't have the right to implement any policy who is not approved by the Troika. So that is one case which is clear, that is because Greece is a poor country with a foreign debt depending on the German banks and the French banks. So clearly there is no uh, self-determination or the capacity of implementing policy in a country like Greece. The second example we have is the Brexit. A rich country like Great Britain took a decision and decision has been respected by the European Union because it's a rich country and it was a surprise, by the way. We talked with Mike before. Nobody expected that the Brexit was approved by a referendum. But it was. So uh, this kind of uh, decision made by the British people has to be respected, which is a different, complete situation like the Greece situation. I make this comparison just to be clear that who takes the decisions in the European Union. Who is deciding uh, what country or, not, or what people have the right to implement different policies? No? And the third situation is the Catalonian situation in my country. I'm not Catalonian, I'm a Spaniard. And I'm a, le I'm a leftist person. And <laughs> so in our perspective, uh, what happened in Catalonia was simply a, a political disaster. I mean, Mikey was there two days before the referendum organized uh, by the Catalonian government, the 1st of October, was there. And you could see on the TV screen two million people, almost the half of the population with the right to vote in Catalonia, going to the street, wanted to vote for the independence of Catalonia. And you saw also in the, street, in the TV the criminal reaction of the uh, Spanish state sending the police against the people. That was terrible. That was really a disaster. But my, my question is, as a left person, trying to understand why or what happened. What happened in Catalonia? 
because only five years ago, only 20% of the population wanted independence. So what happened in these five years that now the half of the population wants to be independent from the Spanish country? And so my first answer is that this demand for independence in Catalonia in some way is a result of the economic crisis in Spain. As you know, because you're an Eastern country, you suffer like the Southern countries of Europe. I love that the, the economic crisis arose in 2008. And Spain was a complete disaster. I mean, because in Spain we have a higher level of standard of living than in Poland, but the way in which we, we decrease our salaries, our public services, our, or the rate of unemployment was so high, so quick, so, so quick, that it was really, it is a, a situation in which we lose our rights, salaries, pensions, public services. So in Catalonia, who always has been the richer part of the country, so they're the rich part, you know, the more industrialized uh, part of the country, there was no national project anymore, since that there was no industry, the jobs changed, I mean, the, almost the half of the young people is unemployed. And suddenly there is another uh, dream, which is the independence of the country, which is really the illusion of a lot of people in Catalonia, which is absolutely um, a good thing. I mean, it's not bad. But the question was, on, under my perspective, is that what is supposed to be something um, rational, which is if you want to be independent, you have the right to vote if you want to be independent or not, which is a left position. I mean, the left always defended the self-determination right as a basic right of the peoples. So we defend the idea that the Catalonian people have the right to vote if they want to be independent or not. That's not the problem. The problem is that the Spanish state will never accept that situation. And which was very curious in this case, it was that the people who defend, defend their independence in Catalonia, they want to be part of the European Union, clearly. Clearly. But the European Union was the first partner of the Spanish government to say no to the independence in Catalonia. So, which was a paradoxical thing, if, if you want, no? Because in Catalonia people want to be independent, but inside the European Union, clearly, with no different project. But if the European Union say no, what is the project then? So now what happened three months later of the referendum in Catalonia is that the situation is completely reversed. There were elections called by the Spanish government, and the result was the same. Almost the half of the population is in favor of independence, and the half of the population wants to keep being Spaniards. No? So there's no political solution at the moment in there. But what is the reality is that the European Union menaced the Catalonian people said, if you are independent, you will be outside the European Union, and it's out the Eurozone. You don't have the Euro, but when you live in a Eurozone, uh, being outside of the Euro means an uh, economic crisis immediately. So I mean, it's, it's using the fear in order to stop that demand of democratization. I don't defend the independence of Catalonia, but I defend the right of the Catalonian to vote. And if that happened, we will ask the Catalonian, please don't leave us alone and stay with us in Spain fighting against the rich guys. But anyway, it's a democracy against the market. Is the democracy against the Troika. So what kind of European Union are we building? A European Union in which the poor countries cannot say what they want, cannot implement a progressive forces. So there is a lot of things to change. And I think using the example of Greece and the example of Catalonia, we can take very good lessons and how can build the Europe we want to build. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, the situation here is a little different. Over 100 years ago, uh, we regained our independence. Then the Second World War came, uh, which, felt, uh, which deprived us of multicultural um, aspect or landscape, but we are still very sensitive to different questions of interference in our sovereignty and our independence. Tomek, can you share your reflections with you about it? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Odbiornik, 
A. Now it should work okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I am in a fortunate position where by I do not represent a country where the problem of a certain part of uh, population uh, concerns the right to secession. So I would like to uh, give you a broad historical uh, outline of uh, the right to self-determination. It should be said that uh, the origins of the concept of uh, the right to self-determination can be found in the 16th or 17th century. But in fact, two basic documents uh, set the foundations. One was uh, the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America and uh, the um, Declaration of uh, um, the Rights of uh, Human Rights and the Rights of the Citizen as a result of the French Revolution. But uh, in the uh, international uh, setting, uh, nothing much happened in this context. The Europe of the 19th century was the Europe of large uh, empires, uh, nationalist empires, where there were some centrifugal uh, movements. However, the rights were never codified in the form of international treaties. Basically, with regard uh, to uh, international law, uh, we can say that it was the First World War that uh, was uh, the breakthrough moment after which uh, the right of self-determination began to be discussed. Uh, the League of Nations uh, was uh, this uh, institution which mentioned uh, uh, the right of self-determination, but then it was uh, um, discontinued as a subject by the International Court of Justice, which considered it as uh, an ethical postulate and not really the right uh, of uh, the nation uh, for self-determination. Then the subject discontinued uh, to be discussed, and it resurfaced uh, in uh, 1945, in the UN Charter, Article 1 of this charter mentions the right of nations to self-determination. But then again, this concept remains so vague, so imprecise, and uh, so unsupported with other documents of international law that, again, it remains a dead letter. Then there are also uh, other international treaties uh, in the form of two documents in particular. Those uh, two documents uh, are developed as a result of tensions between the Eastern and Western blocs. And again, uh, they mention the right of nations to self-determination. However, uh, those uh, remain the dead letter. This uh, provision of uh, the international law for the first time came into force uh, in the period of decolonization. But can we really talk about the right of a nation to self-determination? Well, that's uh, doubtful, because if you have a closer look at the whole process of decolonization, the uh, enforcement of the right uh, to uh, self-determination is very closely linked to a recognition of the right of nations to independence. Very often, the emergence of nations uh, was based precisely on that, uh, ga the gaining of uh, independence by individual parts of previous empires. The end of uh, decolonization brought an end to the discussion of uh, the right to self-determination in the broader international context. Of course, uh, the problem of Palestine remained somewhere in the background all the time. Nevertheless, uh, for Europe, this subject uh, resurfaced only in the 1990s, which was linked to the collapse of the communist system. We uh, had uh, the independence of the former USSR republics. We have uh, the disintegration of Yugoslavia, and we have the phenomenal uh, bloodless uh, division of Czechoslovakia into two separate uh, international entities, that is the Czech Republic and Slovakia. 
The subject again uh, remained dormant uh, for a few years, and it uh, uh, appeared again uh, in the context of Kosovo. Kosovo is, um, by the way, a very specific case, because for some reason, the European Union, of course, uh, guided by its own interests, uh, came up with the idea of the nation of Kosovars to differentiate somehow the uh, Albanese people from uh, Albania, from the uh, Albanese people living in Kosovo. So again, that is um, an example of an action of a large international organization uh, performing some sort of speculation uh, with regard to a nation. By the way, the, a huge um, manifestation is taking place uh, to support uh, unification of Macedonia with Greece. That concerns uh, yet another problem uh, linked to the right of a nation to self-determination, because if uh, you talk um, to a uh, Greek, you uh, will hear opinions which they diverge very much from what uh, someone from Macedonia might say. Getting uh, towards the end of this uh, broad theoretical uh, background, I would like to say that, in fact, in international law, there is uh, the notion of uh, independence being uh, obtained by individual nations, but there is no uh, clearly delineated path towards getting this uh, independence by nations in the ethnographic sense of uh, the word nation. So we are now focusing on uh, the so-called old Europe, but obviously similar problems are faced uh, in the Europe that emerged after the collapse of the USSR. We have the problem of Crimea. We have the problem of Georgia and the centrifugal tendencies in Georgia. Then again, we have uh, the uh, problem of the entire Moldova. Is uh, there uh, such an entity as the Moldovan nation? Because if you ask somebody from Romania, uh, they will tell you that there is no uh, Moldavian uh, nation. And if you ask a Russian um, person, uh, you will hear the answer that, of course, there is such a nation. And we could say that um, uh, there is uh, this issue of the right for a particular entity uh, to get independence exists or not. In fact, uh, only a nation can get uh, um, this independence or self-determination. But then again, in what sense are we talking about uh, uh, the nation getting uh, this uh, right? Can the right uh, to uh, self-determination be uh, um, enacted uh, by uh, uh, official establishing of uh, an independent state, then can uh, we equalize the right to self-determination and the right to secession, and consequently, as a result of secession, joining another state? We are trying to find answers to all those questions, but uh, the problem seems to be, well, let me put uh, uh, this thesis forward, the right to self-determination is uh, exercised uh, by uh, nations using uh, the uh, politics uh, guided by force. Force uh, in the sense of perseverance in efforts to uh, exercise the right to self-determination. And I think that uh, it is not really international organizations like the European Union or Russia as uh, a state trying to treat uh, those issues as an element in its uh, uh, game of um, uh, the balance of powers within the zone of influence. But uh, there are uh, attempts to def define the phenomenon. There is a problem of globalization and the international activity, well, I will use this word, international activity of cartels. It is only um, as a result of overcoming the effects of uh, the activity of the international uh, finance uh, organizations uh, that uh, the right of nations to self-determination can uh, be uh, actualized, can uh, take shape. 
Thank you very much, Tomek, for this uh, brief historical outline and for your thoughts on that. Undoubtedly, the issue of cartelization or the cartels that you have mentioned guides our thinking uh, towards another aspect of uh, this subject, but probably another issue which we should take into consideration in our debate is uh, the issue of uh, major states, major players in the European uh, policy, Germany, France, uh, Spain, or uh, until recently uh, the UK. and the uh, domination of those major states, their imposition of their will uh, on um, minor countries, uh, minor entities, uh, gives rise to objections. That plus the um, uh, international crisis brings about uh, the rise uh, of far right, those far right forces to pursue their uh, particular agendas and interests, use a variety of tricks to gain uh, popularity and support. Those who are in power try to keep the status quo, bringing up the argument of respect for a territorial integrity of the state, which complicates any dialogue. They also um, say, as, as Marga pointed out, uh, that uh, the regions which have uh, separatist tendencies, uh, that they uh, don't want to uh, show any solidarity with the rest, they want to go their own way in order to secure for themselves better standards uh, than for uh, all the citizens within the state in which they function. The question can be asked, how are the left the left, uh, uh, which is uh, undergoing a crisis in European uh, countries, can uh, position itself uh, to this situation. I have the impression that the left, as a movement, doesn't have a uniform and unequivocal uh, stance. For example, uh, if there is a discussion about those separatist uh, tendencies, uh, there is a lot of debate about refugees. And again, there is a variety of positions. Our neighbors in Slovakia have Smer party. This party is not a party that shows very uh, much of solidarity. And uh, this is a party which does not want to approach the issue of uh, solving the problem of uh, refugees in a particular friendly way. Then we have uh, the problem in um, Zeman in the Czech Republic, who uh, has a rather limited understanding of European solidarity. In Poland, we have the former head uh, of uh, Democratic Left Alliance movement, uh, Leszek Miller, who also distances himself from the international solidarity, believing that the international solidarity has its uh, limitations and uh, we cannot uh, um, have so much influence on European policy, and therefore we can uh, afford to uh, take a more distant position. So uh, let's ask this question, how we approach solidarity, how pe we people on the left understand this? Marga. I mean, to be a solidarity person, is, I mean, it's one of the qualities of being a leftist, clearly. No? So one, I think one of the division lines no, between the, the left and other tendencies is precisely to understand that all human beings are equals and we deserve exactly the same rights. But let me start from what uh, Soslo said before about what the left in Europe, the European left, faced this situation because something has changed in the last few years. For years, the European left saw the European Union as something that can be reformed from inside. So all of our debates, even today, are were about being inside the European Union, how to improve it or not, or uh, you know this kind of things. When the economic crisis arrived, let's come back again to the economic crisis. I think there was some part of the left who thought that it was better to leave the European Union. So the whole debate 
around Europe, inside the left, was about it, if it was good or not to be inside the European Union, or if it was good or not for our people to be part of the Eurozone or not. But I think in the last two years, something has changed, in my perspective, in a good direction, meaning that the debate that actually the left in Europe has is not about if the European Union is uh, something good or not. We clearly know that it is not, I mean. But the debate is about how the capitalist globalization has changed the power in Europe, on how the globalization has fragmented the territory and damaging the labor laws in such a way that is changing the rest. So all of our debates now are around exactly that, how the power in Europe is concentrated in the German line and the south of England, I mean Liverpool, Manchester, Denmark, I mean this line, no? uh, and Germany, as the motor of the economy and the financial and the productive system. And how there is two or three peripheries all around this area. So the previous Europe we knew before, which was France and German as a national states taking control of what's happening in Europe, it doesn't exist anymore. They call it the middle Europe, which is the power goes through Germany more, and not, much in, not more in France, not to talk about the south of Europe, which is we are completely outside of the circuit of accumulation of capitalism, completely outside. Not the Eastern countries, you know better than me, that the economy in the Eastern countries depends on low salaries for the companies who has the matrix in the German influence zone. So that's the reason because the, the globalization needs the Eastern countries with low salary and low taxes for foreign companies. But in the south of Europe, and of course Ireland is a th southern country, as everybody knows, uh, we are also really outside this question of power, who take the power, and that's a new situation. So the left now, is we're talking about solidarity in a different way. It's not only about the refugees, but it's all, it's all about how specifically popular and working classes, we can react to this situation in which the losers of the globalization is the European working class as a whole. And it's completely different than the debate that we have 10 years ago. And I think that is really interesting because Let's focus also in the solidarity as the, traditionally the left did in Europe. It's talking about the popular classes and the working classes and how can we got to work together to change this situation and to take more power for, for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say that if we wanted to have a look at the role of uh, dominating states, then we would have to admit that undoubtedly we are having to do now with a domination of uh, Paris-Berlin axis. Moreover, these two countries are trying to formalize their informal domination yet by means of the development of Europe of different speeds and by means of convincing countries of the old European Union to create a separate bloc uh, from countries of the new Union. So this is one of the aspects of domination of Europe by these two European nations. But I believe that in our Polish case here, we see also some traditional Polish concern of the German Empire. Because th this resentment is very strong in Poland and it is going to last for some time because for the last you know decades Poland have su has suffered a number of harms from Germany and the you know children and grandchildren of these people are still alive and I think that this lack of trust will go on for some time at least. Moreover, well, I believe that the European Union would be able to reach, and partially it does reach, 
for such measures and such mechanisms would, would clearly be able to weaken the, such national tensions. One of the forms to do this is transborder cooperation. This is what we have been recently observing at the borders between you know, Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, the concept of Southern Carpathian region. It creates an opportunity to weaken these tensions, especially that it doesn't really concern Poland very much. It concerns very much the question of Hungarian minorities in uh, um, Romania, for example, where those nationalistic tendencies uh, are quite, uh, you know, waking up today. I think that the domination of these two European powers could also be weakened by means of this crazy idea I would like to present to you, it seems to be crazy, but it can be executed. So uh, it is possible to grow the significance of representative bodies like the parliaments or delegations of parliament in the development of foreign policies of different member states. The idea is uh, that foreign policy should not be the sole prerogative of the executive so that it was not uh, in the sole competencies of presidents or governments, but so that uh, foreign policy could be carried out by uh, the representatives of the people, by parliamentary delegations, and in turn this could influence the growing significance of the European Parliament. A significant group of our citizens believe that the European Parliament is a foreign body. It functions somewhere in the European Union. There is not very much difference between the European Parliament and European red tape. But if foreign policy uh, is carried out by an organ which is an organ representing the, the, the nations, uh, would actually change the situation to some extent. And such cooperation would also weaken intergovernmental tensions. Most of the tensions are about not people, but governments. The people are able to communicate very well with each other. The problem is about the governments. And there is also another element, which to my mind influences the fact that there is no left in the debate about European solidarity and European cooperation. I am a socialist from a little bit different, you know, generation, if you will. I'm more of a 19th century and not a 21st century man. So I consider that, it, that the challenges that are in front of the European left, uh, well, they are I have, you know, quite conservative approach to them. I know it may sound stupid, but I have this conservative approach. I believe that the problems the left presented at the beginning of its existence, they have not been solved. But an attempt to move on to modern or post-modern language in the agendas of the left makes the left to be totally un, un you know, un incomprehensible for the people where it functions. So I think that we should go back to something that is simpler something which is more basic in terms of values and that these values should be articulated, these values should be promoted and only after that in the discussions we should add to them different aspects connected with human rights of the third or fourth generation as it is done now. And I think that's it. If I come up with something else I will continue. Um, this is my first time in Poland as well, first time in Warsaw, so again, like say why I how happy I am to be here. It's a great experience to be in Warsaw. Um, we have a very large population of Polish people in my constituency in Yuri Armagh, and I have a lot of interaction and engagement with Polish groups, whether it be women's groups or community groups or religious groups, and um, there is a great um, solidarity with them. So I just wanted to say that before we begin. Um, in terms of um, 
the European Union. We, Sinn Féin as a party in 1973, actually campaigned not to join the European Union. But obviously um, now um, in terms, and, and, and obviously we'll talk about this later in terms of Brexit and how that is going to have a disastrous impact uh, on Ireland as a whole, not just the south of Ireland or the north of Ireland, but Ireland, uh, the whole island of Ireland. And if we look at the European Union in terms of its uh, political order, because um, it's the Union of European States, the European Union, which supplements the economic, political and strategic dominance of the larger European powers, and that has already been mentioned, Germany and France in particular. And during the Eurozone crisis, the power and wealth discrepancies between larger and smaller states were defined as a spectrum of core and periphery European states. The core of the Eurozone dominate the political institutions of the EU and wield the biggest influence in driving the activity and purpose of the European Central Bank. The power of the latter instrument in European affairs is unqualified. As a result of the European fiscal crisis of 2008, the economic direction and domestic political affairs of several European nations, Ireland, Greece and Portugal in particular, were determined by the needs of European capital and its representatives in the European Central Bank. That the biggest bondholders of the European Central Bank remain French and German banks are further illustration of this. And throughout this process, it should be noted that the surrendering of fiscal autonomy by the aforementioned states was done uh, and acquiesced to by a right-wing neoliberal pan-Europeanistic government. And the truth is that in Ireland, future generations will continue to repay the mess that the um, government uh, got us into. Um, and for the bondholders, I mean, it's like someone going in to put a bet on a horse and it loses and you go in the next day and claim your money back. They took a calculated financial risk. And we as a party would certainly argue strongly that that shouldn't have happened and that the tri Troika... I mean, there was one instance with a uh, budget um, for uh, the 26 counties in Ireland. I think the German cabinet saw it before the Irish cabinet, which says a lot about the dominance and, and how acquiescent the uh, Irish government were at that point. As I said before, we... Um, campaign not to go into Europe initially, but we're in Europe and we want to stay in Europe, but the European Union has to be reformed, but it has to be reformed in our opinion from within, and it has to be, um, it has to become a European, um, united European uh, Union of socialist principles and justice and social justice not the, who can shout the loudest and who has the most money. And I think this is one of the issues that we want to address uh, because for an equal role to be established, significant institutional reform is required within the context of the European Union. Uh, obviously, Brexit is something we're going to discuss and that is something that has exercised Ireland, the whole of Ireland, not just the southern state and the northern state, but the whole of the island, because, as I said previously, it will have a disastrous effect. Thank you very much for these words. As I mentioned before, everyone agreed that for us, for the left, it is very important for uh, us to go back to values which are crucial for us. And as Marky just said here, mentioned here, Brexit in 2016 gave new dimension to the question of territorial integrity of the European Union and member states. The Scots, the Irish, the, the Welsh are not largely satisfied with a Brexit decision. And there are stronger and stronger voices uh, that support the development of new uh, entities of the international law. Uh, the Catalonians and the Basques, as Margot said, they want to establish their own countries. 
people in charge of Spain raise an argument that their constitution safeguards territorial integrity and guarantees broad autonomy. It also commits nations to or peoples to be uh, to, to act in solidarity. Those tensions, connected with the growing influence of extreme right in Europe, question further integration processes in Europe. Uh, the shape of it today and the fact that it is still uh, more Europe of capital and not Europe of labor or citizens in a broader sense, it gives us a question, what is ahead of us, further integration or disintegration? Tomek, can you please uh, start? Let me begin with a bizarre statement, perhaps. Namely, that against the appearances, it is a greater autonomy of the regions uh, contributes to different uh, decentralizing tendencies in a state. Why? Because if we transfer some of the competencies to local government, as well as a successful experiment with local government, self-government, as it is, uh, for example, in the Basque country, also some autonomy in tax law, it simply gives evidence to the fact that those lesser entities, smaller entities, they can cope quite well without any intermediary of the headquarters in the form of central government. So after having this experience quite successful with successful self-government, local government, some of those local communities may ask a question. So why do we need Warsaw, for example? Why do we need Madrid? Why do we need several other capitals? with their officials, with their fiscal apparatus, etc., etc. So I think, well, not to mention an example of Belgium, where no one knows uh, uh, why Brussels is there as a capital of Belgium. No one needs Brussels. That is why a question is asked about the strength of those tendencies uh, that go from the center to the peripheries centrifuging tendencies and the question is whether they will be reduced only to the question of self-determination of nations as it is understood in the international law or perhaps uh, they would reach further and go as far as secession and uh, the development of yet another entity of the international law subject of international law quite much as up to attitude of central governments here. However, I think that how the, um, you know, how member states are um, actually uh, approached by Euro bureaucracy will also influence quite much on whether or not the independence or pro-independence uh, postures will develop, uh, or not develop. Brussels, I'm talking about Brussels as a symbol. So if Brussels tries to impose or force different states to act in line with interests which are in conflict with the interests of societies and peoples which are in clear conflict with these interests of local communities, then we'll see how it will develop. The states protest against the activity of the Brussels red tape. So in exactly the same way, national communities in different countries will also protest to the policy that is carried out by central authorities. Uh, I think that it is a real threat. But I believe that there is another thing which will be mentioned. And it is going to constitute a threat to further unification of Europe. This is what is happening along the borders of Europe. For example, uh, the breakup of uh, Ukraine as Ukrainian state, as well as uh, international community tolerates the situation. For example, it is testified by the today's visit of uh, members of local uh, parliaments uh, in Germany, to Ukraine today. Uh, so they tolerate actually the behavior connected with the territorial aggression. And finally, 
there is also something which is unclear. Uh, I mean, why? Why is Europe so uh, so um, reluctant to defend its eastern front line uh, from the Russian aggression? Whenever I'm talking ag uh, aggression, I'm talking about the whole range of different actions. I'm not talking about the military posture. So if this is going to be the process, if the European peripheries are beyond the zone of interest of the most important European players, as well as Brussels headquarters, then I am afraid that that process of the breakup of United Europe will continue. Let me ask a very clear question. Would the breakup apply only to what happened in the third pillar, which is the common um, inter foreign and defense policy, or will it go to other pillars, which is pillar two, which is a common security policy, and even perhaps it will go as far as the first basic pillar, which is economic single market. Or perhaps some solutions will come up which will prefer partners from outside of Europe, like China, the United States, Canada, or some other states, which will be privileged in relations with different countries which today make up United Common European Union. The question is asked, is the European Union heading towards integration or disintegration? And first of all, I would say Brexit is fundamental to this question. There is absolutely no doubt that Brexit was driven by a narrow right-wing agenda, lightly veiled in self-determination, that sought and continues to seek Britain's removal from any aspect of international human rights accountability. A UKIP-inspired Tory-delivered Brexit will mean a diminution of workers' social, civil, environmental and linguistic rights. In order to create some semblance of competitiveness, Britain will, post-Brexit, embark upon a furious race to the bottom. Public services, schools, infrastructure, social housing, the health service, the very thing Brexiteers use to inspire voters to support leaving, will crumble sacrificed at the altar of Tory expediences and callousness. While Brexit was driven by this narrow agenda, it was not delivered by it. There were numerous, clearly enough, progressive people and organisations who campaigned for a leave vote on the basis of the current trajectory of the European Union. This sense of a lack of transparency or equality between states is a sentiment which ostensibly drove the Brexit vote in parts of Britain. The same suspicion of the European Union's current agenda directed opinion also. Constant moves away from a social Europe to a militarised, centralised European superstate rallied voters. The right-wing xenophobia present in the campaign can and should be challenged, but there is no doubt of its strength in mainstream public discourse on the European continent. The resurgent right say that the national sovereignty of their home countries is being gradually eroded through inward migration and EU-led integration. Swathes of post-industrial Europe facing severe and prolonged economic depression, areas in Britain with around 95% white English population voted to leave on the belief that migrants had caused the collapse of public services, the biggest squeeze in wages since the Napoleonic era, and the highest levels of wage inequality in over a century. We know this to be a falsehood, but the far-right success in hijacking the public debate about economic depression and pinning its blame on those with dark skin who speak a different language is a significant factor behind a growth in anti-EU sentiment, xenophobia and racism. Several continents, this is the very same political trend. It's a European problem. And if Europe doesn't change, neither will this problem. 
we have to come to terms with the fact that the far right is marching in the Western world, in France, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic and Hungary, etc. If their success isn't evident at the polls, then it is seen the spike in hate crimes per perpetrated against migrants. I mention this because as a society we ignore or downplay these unsavoury facts at our peril. Established social democratic parties across Europe, for the better part of a generation, capitulated the public sphere to neoliberalism and concerned themselves only with the holding on to of power and not wielding it in the public interest, nor their memberships at grassroots communities. They told everyone that you EU created peace and prosperity was working for all, even when living standards continued to plunge in relative terms. So when Jean-Claude Juncker said that Britain will regret Brexit while saying in the same speech that an EU army, greater fiscal union and ever close federation of European states was a solution to continental divisions, he would have done nothing to address the concerns of millions of European citizens. We have to respond to the real source of problems without pandering to base nativist sentiment. The EU are yet to outline an economic solution to gross wealth inequality and the collapse of communities whose living standards haven't risen in a generation while their frontline services are sold off to the highest bidder. All the while a ste steady diet of racism is being pumped into those same communities by the far right and an ever compliant media obsessed with shock factor. Before shoehorning states into further integration, you must show people you're listening. Juncker's position betrayed a rather arrogant belief that the EU had no responsibility for failing to identify and tackle the real source of the problem. We can prevent EU disintegration through the creation of a social and equitable Europe founded and operated on the principles of cooperation, solidarity and generosity. We must tackle regional economic imba imbalances. We must address EU transparency and accountability failures. And most of all, we need to give European citizens a meaningful and democratic stake in the future directions of the European Union to democratic transformation. And I would say in terms of Brexit, the constituency that I represent in the north of Ireland and Uri and Armagh, we voted to remain. Out of the 18 parliamentary constituencies in the north, 11 of them voted to remain. The vote to remain was 56%, the vote to leave was 44%. So we in the North are faced with a democratic deficit. In other words, our uh, democratic vote has been ignored because it's been subsumed into the British overall vote. Um, and in terms of uh, the impact it will have on my constituency, which is a border constituency, uh, a border, a tariff border, an, eco an economic border will have to be if, if Britain is going to leave the, Europe, the single market and the customs union, inevitably there has to be a border. And I was in Dublin a couple of months ago when Michel Barnier, the EU's um, main negotiator, leading negotiator for Brexit with the British, stated very clearly that there would be a border. Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, who voted to remain in the, uh, the referendum, she came to the North uh, two weeks before the referendum and said if there was a leave vote then there would be a hard border. When she lost the leave vote and she came over two weeks after the referendum and said there wouldn't be a hard border. The British did not expect to lose the referendum so they didn't have plan A, B or C in uh, place. I go to Westminster to the British Parliament to the belly of the beast so to speak every two weeks. We have representatives there every week that the British Parliament sits. Although we don't actually sit in the chamber, we do have offices and we do lobby and we meet all the different parties. And every person that I have asked, whether it be a member of the British government or the opposition or whatever, none of them can give a definitive answer as to how Brexit will out and the site workings, how that will affect, because they really don't know Somebody described it as like jumping over a cliff and hoping that you're going to land on sand, but you may well land or the sea, you may well land on rocks and have a very hard landing. Nobody can tell us the difficulty we have because we are going to be the outpost of the European Union if Britain, uh, if Brexit happens. 
because where I live, I live three miles from the border. So we live in a country of six million people. 26, it's a 32 county uh, country. 26 of those counties will be in the European Union. Six of them won't. It will have a huge economic impact. The farmers that I represent, the small farmers, 80% of their income comes from the European Union in terms of the single farm payment. We have no doubt that the British will never ever uh, recompense farmers and you know make up the difference in their income. So we are faced with economic disintegration, both in the agri-food industry and the agricultural industry. And in my constituency, all our indigenous, all the big industries are indigenous. They're all started. Uh, you have the like of First Derivatives, which is, does uh, IT software for all the major banks in the world. We have uh, Norbrook Pharmaceuticals, which is a multinational company which does pharmaceuticals across the world. We have um, Glenn Dimplex, which does electrical goods, is a multinational company. They were all started by local people. Nobody came in from outside and, and invested money. It was done by local people. It continues to be done by local people. But those industries will be faced with huge, huge problems in terms of a tariff border. And I am old enough to remember a hard border. When there was a hard border, then the British Army came in 1969 and there was very, very hard militarization. And then we had a frictionless border in the last 20 years approximately. So, and we've been told that there will be a frictionless border. It will not exist. How that will happen if Britain pulls out of the single market and the, single, uh, and the customs union? Nobody has been able to explain that. As a party in Sinn Féin, we are asking for a special designated status for the north of Ireland that we will, according to our democratic vote, we will remain within the single market and the customs union. And the benefit of that, apart from the economics, it will also mean that our Republican ideal of a united Ireland, of a reunification of our country, is so much closer. Because Brexit, if it's done anything positive, it has raised the whole issue of reunification of our country. And we are now coming up to the uh, anniversary in 1921 of the uh, formation of the Northern State, which is an artificial entity. It was created to appease a Unionist uh, majority at that time. The Unionists in the last election uh, for the Assembly in 2017 lost the Unionist majority for the first time since the uh, formation of the state. So we are at a very exciting time in terms of Irish politics. And I'll finish this by saying we do want a Brexit, but it is British withdrawal from Ireland, not British withdrawal from Europe necessarily. So thank you. Just one, one request. Can you hold this headset with your earpiece? Yes. Not away from the microphone. Yes. Because so there I'll are actually Sorry, I switched it off. Squeaky. Actually, so. oh, but the, the squeaky, I think ah, right. this That's really what it is. creates the interference. Sorry about that. Right. Thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you. That's me told. Okay, just a few remarks and also about the question of the is the European Union going towards disintegration or more integration? So I think the answer, the correct answer is we don't know, who knows? I mean, the Brexit show us that the unexpected can happen, even in something so serious like being part or not of the European Union. Like Mike said, nobody expected in Great Britain that the Brexit won, and it did. So I really don't know, but what I know is that there is a, a paradox now in Europe, which is, I think, for me the most interesting thing. We talked before about how strong German, Germany is uh, in Europe, which is true in terms of economics, and how far from the economic power the south of Europe is, which is true. But it was, what is paradoxical is that in the southern Europe, is where the left is stronger. Stronger enough to influence or to govern the countries. We have now in Portugal a socialist party government supported by the two left political parties, the Communist Party of Portugal and the bloc of left in Portugal, making really progressive 
policies in Portugal, really, really progressive. In Spain, we have Unidos Podemos, which is together we, we can, which is Podemos plus United Left, which is my political party. And we have now in the polls, let's say, between the 17 and 20 percent of the votes, which is the same like the Social Democrats or the right wing parties. We have in France that the Mélenchon presented to the elections and they, he took 20 percent of the votes for the first time in history of France, I think. We have Syriza in Greece, and we, we don't have the same situation in Italy, but the conditions for a strong left is also in Italy too. And of course, we have Sinn Féin in Ireland with a, an expected vote really, really very high, this 26, 24 percent. Yeah, it's one of the higher leftist parties. So, what I'm trying to say is that even the situation is not very good in terms of how the balance of powers is changing inside Europe. At the same time, in the periphery, there is opportunity and hope to change the situation inside the European Union. Because the European Union is a mechanism based on the consensus. If you have two or three countries, you can change the European Union from inside, or at least influence enough to stop the most uh, aggressive politics. So I think the hope is now in the peripheries. We are in another periphery of Europe, which is Poland and the Eastern countries, and my hope is like now in the East countries also, we can see debates and th people thinking in another way of being part of this common project, which is the European Union. Thank you very much uh, for those statements, and now I would like to open a discussion. Daniel, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Daniel Bieniewski. I have uh, two questions. The first is to uh, Miki. What is the approach of your party to Brexit in general? And what are the real chances of uh, independence for Scotland? Or uh, maybe later, independence of Northern Ireland? And what are the uh, planned activities of your party? If uh, uh, there is a unification, what would be the idea of your party for uh, a situation which might emerge if this scenario takes place? And the second question is to Marga. What is the position of your party on uh, the question of the independence of Catalonia? Nobody knows how the situation develops. But does your party have any idea how to mitigate those separatist moods, or is it more in favor of the independence of Catalonia? Yeah. And then uh, will there be some sort of uh, izquierda, but will that be unida any longer? Will that be left, but uh, united or not? Any other questions? I have an observation. What is happening right now in the European Union is uh, to some extent the result of the situation in which the European left missed the moment when uh, the European Union was expanding. In Poland, the left naively believed that uh, Polish uh, joining the European Union would mean improvement of the living standards in uh, Poland, while the Western uh, left was not interested at all in the situation in Poland or other countries of Central Europe without having a knowledge of the uh, social conditions uh, in those countries. And we naively believe that the European Union would uh, make would mean an improvement in the rights of um, employees, uh, better labor relations, better social relations. And now it turns out that the new countries of the European Union are pulling down the European Union. There is social dumping, uh, Polkstein Directive, uh, for example, on uh, the rights related
designated to um, uh, delegated employees, uh, seconded employees, where the governments of Central European countries are pulling down the uh, social standards. The situation is somewhat similar in Ukraine. Ukraine, in the name of uh, German interests, uh, was also treated as a potential source of cheap labor and uh, the market on which various European products could be sold because the association agreement between uh, Ukraine and uh, the Union, uh, which was, well, non-signing of this agreement was in fact the starting point of all this uh, uh, mess and it was very unfavorable for uh, Ukraine. It uh, meant a uh, lot of reductions and constraints in uh, the social rights in that country. Now uh, the um, authorities uh, in uh, Ukraine are now introducing solutions which uh, uh, which are more uh, beneficial than those promoted by Western Europe. Anya? I'm not sure whether that's going to be a question. Maybe it's more of a comment. Hopefully, it will elicit some response from you, and maybe you can uh, say whether you agree with that or not. Let me put it this way. The fact that in uh, the countries uh, around the European Union, neighboring countries to the European Union, all the countries in the south or in Eastern Europe, there is a rise in the anti-European mood. On the one hand, uh, that um, uh, seems of interest to the left. Poland maybe is a separate case, but uh, I think it mainly concerns the south of Europe, where the left is uh, becoming stronger and stronger. At the same time, however, nationalist movements or even fascist movements are getting stronger and stronger, and they, in my opinion, um, are relying on false beliefs, uh, false beliefs which are uh, spread based on a uh, false uh, historical policy, utilization of past historical problems uh, on the international arena, which still can uh, arouse emotions in various communities, like the very concept uh, of a nation. For me, uh, the notion of a nation is very vague, not precisely defined. So we are for sure dealing with some sort of uh, denial of uh, European Union in those communities. And why is that happening? Well, this is happening because the European Union adopted a globalization model which uh, was um, opposed uh, by uh, many communities uh, a long time ago. The neoliberal model of uh, the economy with huge implications on the social level made the European Union become detached from social needs. Now I'm trying to imagine a situation in which the European Union uh, becomes a social Europe, a Europe of equality of various regions, a Europe of uh, uh, a different approach from what we are seeing, a Europe where uh, the model of globalization is changing. Well, and that's a question to you. In such a situation, would uh, we uh, also see those uh, uh, decentralization uh, tendencies uh, with uh, nations uh, trying to get out of the European Union? Or maybe with uh, this uh, alternative approach, there would be no point in uh, any uh, divergence. Uh, we would uh, focus on seeking things that we have in common because this globalized world uh, would force us to look for things that uh, bring us together. The European uh, Union should rely on human rights, very broadly understood human rights, and be united on their basis. So I think that in answer to the question which was uh, asked a moment ago, what uh, the left should do in order to uh, have a say 
in the situation and what is going on. Of course, the left should, in uh, the countries in which it uh, operates, try to get uh, the power um, and um, Another uh, path might be an attempt to get to power in the European Parliament. That might be uh, this uh, uh, Yanis Varoufakis movement in 25 uh, might be a certain uh, proposal how to bring about this change. So, for sure, we need uh, to uh, gain uh, popularity, and this can be done by um, demystifying a false language, by showing the real underlying interests, by uh, referring to true objective interests of uh, um, people uh, who uh, work, uh, normal people, ordinary citizens. The left should be um, mainly interested in the well-being of the workforce rather than in some abstract uh, ideas, which of course uh, are there, which uh, should be discussed. But in my opinion, this economic equality is the basic uh, tenet of the left, which uh, should guide us also uh, in defining our platform, uh, electoral platform for the European Parliament or uh, in defining other movements like PM25 to uh, gain some weight that would help bring about changes. Dorota Pasi. In my opinion, there has been an appropriation of the European uh, institutions, which are the ownership of all citizens of the European Union, by capital cartels plus officialdom, which is now in charge of the institutions, which is completely inadmissible and, inaccept and unacceptable. question to uh, any panelist in a longer time perspective do you see any possibility for us citizens of Europe to regain the ownership of the institutions that we ourselves created is there a possibility to regain uh, the ownership of those institutions by uh, not doing anything by dealing with other uh, subjects so we uh, citizens of the European Union uh, admitted the situation we allowed this to happen our institutions were appropriated by uh, all uh, those forces which are completely unauthorized to uh, such an appropriation the European Union are us it is not uh, a foreign body it is us, all citizens of Europe. So a very specific question. Is it possible for us, the Europeans, to regain our European Union? Or does it have to be uh, destroyed and something new must be created instead? Anyone else? Michał Sarnicki. I have a general comment, which I think should be uh, mentioned here to explain the source of uh, the strength of fascist movements in Europe and the counter-revolution that seems to be emerging in Poland and in Europe. Social democracy. Uh, went bankrupt after the uh, USSR uh, collapsed. There was a dismantling of uh, uh, welfare uh, states. At least in uh, Poland, the left uh, uh, was also dismantled uh, and uh, gravitated somehow towards the far right. So if we try to discuss such broader issues, we should be aware uh, of uh, what we are really discussing. We should uh, look at those root causes 
the globalization, the, uh, the fact that the European Union from the very beginning of its uh, existence uh, always uh, has always lobbied uh, in favor of uh, big capital. And I believe it should be reiterated. Uh, in fact, uh, the European Union has uh, never supported um, workforce. We should uh, simply call things by their names and uh, bring up this uh, point. Thank you. And Piotr has a question too. I have a question with reference to what was said about uh, the future of Spain and uh, Catalonia. I would like to ask our guests how your parties see the future of the European Union. Is there any future at all? What this future should be like? What should be the changes of directions uh, that uh, the left should support? What sort of uh, program for the European Union should the left promote? And how, in this context, uh, uh, the position of weaker countries, the south of Europe, or uh, well, the countries like Spain or, or Greece, but also how, uh, what in this context, would be the role of uh, Eastern Europe? Because I'm really curious whether your parties uh, consider this at all, whether you have some reflection on Eastern Europe. Because uh, on the one hand, we have uh, similar problems, but on the other hand, politically, we are very different because the trends on the left are very different. The democracy is weakening, that's uh, similar. But on the other hand, our left is not uh, gaining strength, just the opposite. It's weakening this uh, dissatisfaction with diminishing democracy uh, is uh, um, a source of benefits for uh, the right. You uh, have uh, seen other difference of other reactions. So we do not uh, have uh, any strength on the left. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Tim Clapham, uh, there are, you've been talking about the disintegration by, or the lack of democracy effectively in the European Union that has been taken over by capitalism. Uh, there are four basic movements that are uh, being considered at the present time. Uh, the first is the party of European socialists are pushing forward the idea and are likely to be using the idea of a pan-European list of uh, politicians. Uh, how do you see that? Do you think that is progressive? Uh, further, do you feel that the, one of the solutions is enhancement of the European Parliament. Uh, the problem at the present time, as we all know, is that much of the decisions are taken by unelected bodies, by the Council of Ministers, not unelected of course, uh, but uh, by uh, the Council. And perhaps more powers uh, to uh, the Parliament would be uh, one of the solutions to the problems we face. Uh, the third uh, principle I'd like to suggest is it is it now about time the left started talking uh, remembering our traditional um, uh, transnational roots uh, started su supporting the idea that we should in fact now have citizenship and be members of Europe uh, as a whole in other words I as a Brit would be a, a European citizen not a, a Brit not a Pole not not a German uh, how, how do you see that would also support uh, should we say a reintegration of the interests of the European Union to those of, of the left thank you Is there anyone else? I would like to encourage everyone to speak. Thank you very much for these interesting voices. First, I would like to invite Meke to speak about it to be followed by Tomasz and Marge. I would like Marge as a partner of our foundation from the European Network for Alternative Thinking and Political Dialogue 
would close the meeting today. I also would like to invite you to come to our next meeting, which will take place next month, in early March. And th that meeting will be on decommunization phenomena. We will try to answer a question, what decommunization is. And now I would like to give the floor to Mickey. Thank you. Um, there were a number of questions, um, and I'll start one. The first one of the first questions was, um, "What is Sinn Féin's uh, attitude to Brexit?" Well, we are absolutely and totally opposed to Brexit. Um, I did mention earlier, we are now asking for designated special status for the north, the six counties in the north of Ireland. Um, and that we would remain within the European, uh, the customs union, and the single market. Now that would reflect the democratic vote of 56% to remain, as opposed to 44 to leave. I, I would also say that the uh, vote to remain from the north um, is reflected right across our community. It wasn't just a nationalist Sinn Féin vote. It also reflected unionist stroke loyalist um, people in the north who, who voted to remain. Um, and obviously the um, attitude of special status is something that we will continue to campaign for. Um, there have been a couple of questions in terms of uh, citizenship. And we are faced with a, a, an interesting uh, dilemma in a sense, because the British have to try and sort this out. Under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, people in the north of Ireland are entitled to a British passport and an Irish passport. Uh, as someone as an Irish Republican, I don't necessarily agree with the dual nationality, but, but um, I have an Irish passport. So if Brexit happens, as it's supposed to um, in March 2019, I would still be a European citizen. Um, it's as simple as that. And, uh, the British haven't really addressed that problem. Now, we've asked them on several occasions, can they actually uh, qualify or quantify what that actually means? The other point that I'd make, since the advent of Brexit, the number of uh, applications for Irish passports has increased hugely uh, from all sides of the community in the north. So. Um, it's interesting uh, that even in loyalist areas like the Shankill Road in Belfast, the week after Brexit, the post office ran out of Irish uh, passport application forms. As an elected rep who is able to uh, sign these forms for people, we are inundated with these forms. And the um, passport office in Dublin had to employ 200 extra people just to deal with the applications. I've even had Scottish Nationalist members of Parliament asking me uh, about their Irish ancestry and could we possibly get them an Irish passport. So the citizenship is quite an interesting one for us. And while it, uh, I don't wish to be flippant about it, it will raise a big question come um, March of next year uh, when Britain is supposed to, although there will be transitional periods in that. Um, another question was asked was about Scotland. The Scottish, obviously, in the referendum for independence, um, it was quite a close, quite a close vote, and that happened towards the end. If Gordon Brown had been as good a prime minister of Britain as he was, as an advocate to remain within the UK for Scotland, then he would have done a, an awful better job of it. Um, Scotland, I think, will wait and see how they're going to be affected, because there has been an argument for them, and Nicola Sturgeon has put that argument forward as their uh, first minister, to remain within the single uh, market and the customs union. That's an ongoing argument. The problem is, um, and I know this from talking to uh, Welsh, Scottish, and obviously ourselves, the devolved administrations have had little or no input into the negotiations. They've been, to all intents and purposes, ignored by the British government. So that's a big issue. Um, in terms of uh, a question was asked about um, the attitude to uh, countries in Eastern Europe, um, 
Well, I suppose what I would say about the, my, my own part of the world, we are still a society coming out of conflict. We haven't come out of conflict. We're very much still coming out of conflict. So we tend to be more concerned at this particular point in time with our own issues, and that is um, in dealing with the uh, Good Friday Agreement, because we are arguing that all the uh, parts of the Good Friday Agreement need to be implemented in full. The reason we don't have an assembly in the North is because those uh, that agreement, which is an international agreement, it's largely the United Nations, is co-guaranteed by the British and Irish government, where we're asking them two governments is to step up to the plate and ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is implemented, um, and that hasn't happened uh, to date. And you know, you, you may read a lot in the media, you may hear a lot in the media about um, Sinn Féin and the DUP are um, at loggerheads and there's red lines on both sides. As far as we are concerned, there are no red lines. We are simply asking for an agreement that was um, negotiated and agreed in 1998, and subsequently the St Andrews Agreement, subsequently the Stormont House Agreement, and subsequently the Fresh Start Agreement, that those should be honoured as they were agreed to at the time. And the reality is that we have people in the North who had relatives killed and who died during the conflict some of those people are waiting an inquest for 46 years. Now, in a so-called democracy, that simply should not be the case. We now have British MPs asking for an amnesty for British soldiers who killed people during the conflict. We are arguing that everybody should be subject to justice. Republican prisoners in the North did something like 35,000 years in jail. The Good Friday Agreement did let people out as part of that agreement political prisoners, but the point is a lot of those political prisoners, some of them had done up to 20 years in jail for alleged crimes that they had, had committed uh, during the conflict. So there are all sorts of issues going on. Um, in terms of um, how the left may influence the European Union, from our own perspective, uh, we are on the upsurge in terms of the uh, electorate, both north and south. So the situation may well arise that in the next general election in the south, of Ireland and it has to be pointed out that the two political parties in the South are really part of the counter-revolution that happened after the War of Independence. I mean you have Fine Gael who are now the dominant party in coalition with Fine Fáil. Fine Gael was founded by Ian O'Duffy who is a fascist who took a brigade to fight with Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Apparently they weren't good enough so Franco sent them home again. They weren't particularly good at fighting. So uh, they, they, he has been airbrushed out of their uh, way website. He doesn't appear on it anymore apparently. But we have photographs of him uh, reviewing the troops so to speak and giving the fascist salute and wearing blue shirts with fascist insignia. That's still, that's, that, that's, that's still part of history. Um, and I think if Sinn Féin, uh, um, we're not asking for it, somebody mentioned about the independence for the north of Ireland. The north of Ireland, the six east, south, uh, northeastern counties, is an artificial statelet created by the British in 1921, never meant to succeed, never meant to be long term, as indeed was the creation of the 26 counties in my opinion, was supposed to be a failed economic entity because, let's be realistic, if the North had succeeded economically and the South had succeeded economically, there would have been a threat to the British economy. So it would be reasonable to suggest that neither of them were, were meant to succeed and both of them were supposedly relatively short term. What we are saying is, with the re reunification of our country, Sinn Féin has a vision for a different Ireland. We have a vision for an Ireland of equals we have a where everybody would be equal. And if anybody, it was the 100th anniversary of the 1916 rising in 2016. If anybody's ever read the proclamation, which is as relevant today as it was in 1916, it's an inclusive document. It includes women, it includes men, it includes the children of the country. It's, it's a, a if you like, a uh, um, blueprint for e economic success, for social justice, for equality, for all of those things. So we're still uh, going towards that. And you know, as far as we're concerned, our ultimate, ultimate objective is reunification as Irish Republicans. But we're not talking about, and sometimes when I, uh, when I was in the Assembly and you spoke to schools, particularly schools from the Protestant um, section of the community. They think we want to join up with the 26 counties in the morning and have someone like Leo Radica or his predecessor Andy Kenny as our Taoiseach 
God forbid, because those people are so, they're about two steps to the right of Attila the Hun, might be the best way of describing them. So as far as we're concerned, we're talking about a completely different vision of Ireland. We're talking about an Ireland of equals, a new Ireland, an Ireland which has um, social justice, an Ireland which provides um, a health service free at the point of need, and all of those things, a proper welfare service, a proper um, judiciary, a proper uh, police service, all of those things. And that will take a long, well, it hopefully not take that long because if one thing Brexit has done, it has raised the whole issue of reunification. And for the first time in my lifetime, people in the southern government have actually talked about reunification. And um, Simon, Simon Coveney, who's our new, uh, the new foreign minister in the southern, in the south of Ireland, at a meeting that I was at a number of weeks ago in Leinster House, he did say that he hoped there would be a united Ireland in his lifetime, and he qualified it by saying in his political lifetime. So we're striving and working towards that, and we'll continue to do that. So it's certainly on the horizon. It's going to happen. Part of the Good Friday Agreement is a unity referendum or a border referendum as some people like to call it. The difficulty is that is at the behest of the British Secretary of State when he or she decides that um, it's, it's relevant and needs to be done. The difficulty with the Secretary of State we've had over the years, it's almost as if they've done something terrible in a previous life to be sent over to the North. It's almost like a punishment because they've absolutely no interest. The current Secretary of State, I think she came to Ireland for the first time when she was appointed to the job. In the election that I stood in for Westminster in 2015, the Conservatives had a candidate. I think he got 157 votes. And when I asked him had he ever been to Ireland, he'd never been before, yet he was sent over as a candidate to represent people in the constituency that I stand in. So there's all sorts of issues around that. But it's as, as far as the European Union goes, and I did mention it before, we agree that the European Union has a lot of problems, a lot of faults. We accept that if it's going to be reformed, it has to be reformed from within. And ultimately our objective is a socialist government in Ireland, in a united Ireland, which can then move towards uh, reform the European Union. And I'll finish by saying part of the democratic deficit is if Brexit goes ahead, we will lose Martin Anderson, who represents the North and is probably one of the most active left-wing socialist uh, MEPs uh, uh, in the European Union and is working extremely hard to ensure that Brexit has no impact on the six counties. Thank you. Szanowni Państwo, ze wszystkich pytań poza tym. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, apart uh, from uh, uh, those uh, questions related to the two countries whose representatives we have here, um, well, actually, we could um, divide the questions into two broad categories. One is about the future of the European Union. Does the European Union have any future at all? And the second group of questions uh, centered on the role of the left. Uh, both uh, within individual countries and in the broader European context. As regards this first, um, broader category, that is the future of the European Union, someone asked uh, whether uh, the European Union could be regained uh, for the citizens. Well, not just uh, uh, we can, but we should, we must. If the European Union is not regained by its citizens, it will be a foreign body, an extra element uh, developed on top of uh, those European nations. Unless we start treating the European Union as something um, that is our own, something that determines the life uh, here in Poland, in the Czech Republic, anywhere, and we as the citizens of our country and as the citizens of Europe do have a say about uh, the development of uh, solutions adopted in the European Union. Unless all that happens, nothing uh, will come out of the European uh, Union project. We will come back to the uh, origins, to the community of steel and coal. I think the um, upcoming elections to the European Parliament should be an opportunity, or are the opportunity for a debate about the future shape of the European Union. Will this European Union 
union uh, finally become a social union, a union of justice and equality, or will it continue to remain a bureaucratic uh, organism where decisions are made and some committees whose members are selected by some mysterious processes and uh, which operate uh, to promote uh, interests of uh, not clearly identified uh, bodies or individuals. That uh, campaign uh, of elections to the European Parliament should be an opportunity for this debate. And we, as people of the left, should explain the need for this discussion about uh, uh, reforms. And it is, in fact, not a discussion about a dismantling of the European Union, because sometimes there are those dichotomic uh, divisions. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there are uh, those uh, people from bad left which uh, accepts the European Union as it is uh, and fighting the right and to those who question the uh, good sides of the European Union are those uh, bad people from the right uh, who want to take Poland away from the European Union. And this is the wrong uh, level of debate. This is a level of bargaining or haggling um, in a local market. Uh, it is uh, about the strength of your voice and uh, the ability to shout louder rather than uh, the ability to focus on uh, the substance. So we should focus on the substance instead. But what this uh, substance is, what the left is, the left is a huge uh, concept. It is a vast notion which encompasses very diverse movements, sometimes pursuing very uh, different goals. And uh, all that causes a confusion about uh, what the left is. I think we should uh, uh, skip this stage of uh, debate, skip the, those definitions of what the left is. All those who feel some sort of affiliation, association with the left should uh, identify their own catalog of core values, which should be followed if you want to be part of this broadly understood left. When I uh, watch uh, the left in Poland, I have the impression that uh, this uh, is becoming uh, more um, and more of a sect. I don't want to offend anyone, uh, but uh, uh, there are those divisions and subdivisions who are more left than those who are less left creating a left platform, but left, again, meaning uh, this uh, general uh, compliance with a core uh, set of values would um, give a new momentum to uh, uh, the left in Poland, because, uh, in fact, uh, the left in Poland does not really exist. Uh, there are um, just minor uh, efforts. Creating a Polish left is one problem to solve. But there is another problem, uh, creating a European left. Unless we start treating the European Union as something common, we uh, will never treat a European left as something common. In my opinion, those two elements, European left and the European Union in a new shape, uh, which focuses on social union, uh, union uh, focused on its citizens, are uh, inextricably linked. What is happening in uh, the European uh, left uh, makes me think that um, we uh, uh, lack another international. I don't want to give it a number. There were some of these in the past. But an exchange of experiences, because in fact the problems uh, which we encounter in Poland, for example, are not po problems uh, limited to Poland alone. The same uh, problems concerning precariat uh, co uh, concern Spain, Italy, UK, and a uh, whole lot of other countries uh, of the so-called old Europe. We before we uh, are able to uh, 
uh, find a common language and uh, speak in a single uh, voice, we uh, first uh, start to meet and talk and communicate. We also need to communicate with our communities uh, in a comprehensible language, not using the uh, lofty language of sociology and philosophy, but use the simplest political message as it was before the internet developed, simple, written, printed word. And uh, there was also a question about European identity. What is this uh, thing, European identity? Can it be built at all? I think it can, but while building this European identity, we need to reject certain ideological ideological approach to the building of this identity. We should agree that uh, the identity was built by uh, the Roman Empire, by uh, uh, the uh, first and second international, creating a mechanism which would uh, build a common European identity would be much facilitated by building a European left. Because the problems faced by individual countries are very similar. They are just uh, named differently. And building a common European left which agrees on some core objectives and some core methods of operation may bring about uh, us being able to exercise more pressure, more efficiently exercise this pressure on the European Union. Okay, thank you very much. Related the question related to what uh, my political party, United Left, or Podemos also in Spain thinks about the Catalonian, how to resolve the Catalonian question, the answer is that we don't want the independence of Catalonia, but we defend a legal referendum. So if we are in the government or have the opportunity to influence the government in Spain, we're going to open a dialogue with the Catalonians to make a legal referendum so they, have to, they can decide if they, have, they want to be independent or not like the British may with the Scotland. Uh, that is the example uh, we defend on that. No? I, I, I really like the question about how we in the Western or in the West Western, like Spain, see the Eastern countries. No? Because, you know, I had the sensation that most of the people in Spain is not at the, you know, it's, it's south. When the large enlargement of the European Union we knew that the, there was a social dumping because of this enlargement in the eastern countries. We knew that. But that was at the beginning, 20 years ago. Now I think there is a current of sympathy because we know that we are countries with low wages. I mean, a cheap job. And this, uh, this you know, sympathy that is like in Spain or in Portugal or in the south of Italy or in Greece, that our countries, uh, our people are competing because of cheap labor. And, and I think that kind of sympathy uh, is existing and is something I think we have to strengthen also. No? At the, the European left faced the question of the European Union, as you said, in an ultra criticism of about the situation today. The problem is that when you see, okay, the European Union is such a uh, bourgeois and bureaucratic system defending the ultra neoliberalism imposing to the countries that is something you cannot defend it is true but on the other hand what is the what is the uh, what is the answer to this problem to exit the european union and to have your own currency with your boundaries and and competing in a globalist globalized world being portugal or, or Spain, I mean, or the answer is trying to change the European Union, even completely with a new treaty, which is another proposal people from the left is doing, a new treaty, thinking that what we need, we do believe as a leftist, because we are internationalist, is that we need an integration process. 
we do believe in political and economic, not only economic, political integration process. So we can take the European Union as it is, and depending on the balance of power, trying to change, change from within or trying to launch for a new treaty. I know it's difficult, but they did it five years ago when, five, no, sorry, 15 years ago when they launched the European Constitution, you remember? And it was reje rejected by the two countries, France and uh, Holland was, no? Holland. Yes. So, uh, and I remember at the time we, we all start to think from the left the idea of a, uh, of a European constitution from for the people, not for the rich. So I think it's on the table that uh, that question, but it depends also on the balance of power. What is true is that some people is start thinking that there is some kind of polar polarization in Europe, no, far right, and on the other hand, a strong left in the south, no. But I think it's false. I think that we are living is that. that I mean, and the empty of the democracy, and uh, what we have to do is also to put more democracy. What is the answer? As always, is more democracy. So, what is only just two two things? Probably the next week, the European Parliament is going to debate about the possibility of have transnational list for the European elections. So I think it's a good idea if that is approved, but I don't know, I don't think so, really. I think the big political parties, they don't want to share power, so I think they are not going to accept that uh, you can present the transnational list for the European election, but I think it's a good idea. The same with Barufakis' proposals of DN25. I think creating alliances among all of us who think that we can change things is something really we need. It's good per se, so I think it's something which, I mean, in transfer we work with the N25 in the things we are in common. The thing we are not in common, okay, we we'll try to deal, how can we deal with it, but anyway, it's a good idea uh, to, to, to work in all of the people who think that we can think, make the things differently. And the last remark is, what kind of euro do we want at the European left? Uh, that is a difficult question. Anyway, what is clear is in our debate we decided that we want for Europe exactly the same that we want for our nations, which is you know, uh, uh, a social country for the workers and for the people. No? And what is clear is what we want is a very democratic Europe, it's something completely different than what it is now. One of the biggest de the demand is no austerity anymore, more democracy, radical democracy in uh, all around Europe. We want for Europe a federal Europe, I mean, Defending the self-determination of nations is clear, uh, uh, a basic right to be together if we want to be together, and clearly also to, to decide for the rest of the Europeans the same way we want for our own countries. So I think it's, it's a long path to, to get it, but I think we can do it in our lifetime, as you said before. Sorry, what is that? <laughs> so I thought that you are... <laughs> Uh, Marga, I thought you would close and wrap up our discussion, uh, so I will uh, make this uh, wrap up of the discussion. Thank you once again for finding the time to join us here and for uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, have this discussion. I would like to thank the interpreters as well uh, for helping us in the communication. It is uh, the second uh, meeting that was streamed and that was a huge help as well. And the next meeting will probably take place on the 3rd of March, uh, uh, you will find information on our Facebook profile. The tea, coffee and snacks are available uh, downstairs. Thank you.